huge deal that we understand that there was something, or there's an original sin, or there's an original defect about the document which we needed to fix somewhere. One of the things we are saying is that it caused a lot of our political problems. And some of the assumptions we have made in putting in place this particular constitution have clearly failed. One, we want a limited government. By that, we mean an executive that is checked. So we wanted a constitution that thrives on a system of checks and balances. But if today so many of the political actors and or persons are calling it an executive or an imperial presidency, then we have failed in transition, properly transition from a, demo, a dictatorship into a democracy. Mm. The second thing is that we wrote a document which cut out the people from the process. And by this, I mean it. By one, when you take the constitution, there's no place for how people can make suggestions for, for reviewing or changing any parts of the constitution, which is what we call the popular initiative. Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist. We've cut out the people from the lawmaking process itself, because we say it's a representative government, meaning that even if you want to do a petition to parliament, you can't do it. Parliament now would write back to you and say, that is not the proper way. Mm. The proper way to do it by which they mean is that a member of parliament must take it and lay it on the table and move it as their own motion. So it's not a people's thing. So we have to take all the things we know about the ways in which we've done things in the mm. past right. and be willing to subject all of that to scrutiny. But the bigger question I want to answer is, a lot of times people say, why are you embracing the call for a new constitution and not a review or a piecemeal amendment? Mm. Once you look at our constitution, all you have to decide is that there's a clear distinct political class, which all you have to do is to sort them out. Once you sort that class out, you can do anything with our, with our democracy. And so we have to create avenues to break that by our Supreme Court. Whatever is produced from that constitution review process is only an advice to the executive. That's right. And an advice which they can take or reject. So the risk of just summary rejection continues to haunt a constitution review process. For the president to decide in the uh, in, in the comfort of his study that he is satisfied that there must be a review of the constitution, and that by that process engage the process of constitutional review. And if anything else at all, it should be at the very least the parliament of the of the republic at any one given time that will stand for to say that the, 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 these are matters which we think should engage the public attention so that there can be a collective. But for the president to say he's satisfied that there ought to be a review and thereby engage the process, I thought it was flawed. I said it to the Constitutional Review Committee. To have a republic that has lasted nearly 30 years in the context of our history, to change the constitutional arrangements that have assisted this durability, we should be very careful how we go about it. moment for Ghana to review thoroughly the 1992 constitution. So I look forward to uh, the coming days of a, a, a presidential uh, review commission mm -hmm. on the work that was done under President uh, J.E. Mills right. so that this is the time that we should embark on the needed constitutional reforms. We stand together in terms of uh, parity of numbers and strength. Mm -hmm. And this is where we can do meaningful adjustment to the 1992 constitution so to which serve specific the areas people would of you Ghana. Want to see some reforms? Uh, the constitution. There are those who are convinced about uh, decoupling uh, ministers from uh, uh, being uh, members of parliament. Mm -hmm. There are those who believe in the establishment of the independence involvement uh, committee. Mm -hmm. I just think that primarily, uh, unless President Nana Dudonko has some fundamental disagreement, he should respect the white paper that President Mills issued as president of Ghana on the constitutional review uh, 
uh, report or further review it and improve upon it. Mm -hmm. and Good afternoon. You're welcome back to continue the very important discussion on change of the Constitution. This is a crusade revived and pushed by Fix the Country. Fix the Country has a very influential convener, Oliver Baca. Vomawo, who is a lawyer, he's a researcher, and is with the Cambridge University. He began the discussion with us last week, and we continue the second and final part today, keeping to our promise, and to also have you join and participate in this discussion. Oliver, thank you so very much once again for making the time. <laughs> thank you for having me again. Great. So, last week, by way of some very rough recap, you gave us some points. And here we are talking about 10 reasons why the Constitution needs to be overhauled, changed completely, and not amended piecemeal or reviewed, so to speak. Number one, you said the original sin, that people voted for a Constitution, they did not know its contents. We are familiar with the argument that this constitution was made for a dictator. It was made for Jerry Rawlings. And there are clear provisions that are in the constitution that vindicate this point, protecting the dictatorship, as in the period that he was president. Number two, so that's one big reason we need to change the constitution. Number two, that's... This is why almost all stakeholders have repeated or repeatedly called for the constitution to be overhauled. In fact, now President Akofuado, whom you have now heard, suggesting that he does not subscribe to a complete overhaul of the constitution, was one of the proponents before he became president for a complete overhaul of the constitution. He actually used to use that word, overhaul. Now he says he doesn't believe in that. Why? Number three, the Review Commission, Constitution Review Commission, as set up in 2010, identified as many as 400 areas for change. This justifies a complete overhaul against piecemeal amendment. Number four, you note that by the, 2020, by the 2010 review, 41 entrenched provisions of the Constitution were up for a referendum. Then you had about 57 non-entrenched provisions up for amendment. This is near impossible and subject to legal challenge, a further justification for a complete overhaul. An imperial presidency, and we have heard many constitutional scholars repeat an imperial presidency appointing some 4,000 plus officers and is almost left unchecked by those expected to check him. And you spoke about the new arrangement for our new constitu this constitution, which is a combination of the executive and the uh, so because of that combination now, the president has to appoint the majority of ministers from parliament. So everybody is looking to attract the attention of the president. So they don't want to hurt him. In fact, if you want to impeach the president, it's almost impossible in our current architecture because the majority in parliament will not allow that to happen. Then we, had, we have a situation... Again, you note where the electors have no power of recall to discipline errant representatives. The people who elect MPs do not have the power 
to remove them before four years. And that is not good. So one, two, three, four, five, six reasons. I think I have put about two together to get six. So let's continue and see today if we can exhaust uh, very quickly some five more reasons why the Constitution needs to be completely overhauled by way of a change rather than piecemeal amendment. And then we'll have our audiences join us. Is my recap accurate? No, I think it's very representative of the conversation we had and, and also mops up you know, some of the ideas which have existed in our, in our body politic around why we need these reforms. So I think yes, that's justice to the conversation we had. Great. So um, <clears throat> where do we move to after we you know, concluded uh, yeah. from the point where we ended? Um, so we, we, we were identifying the different parts of frameworks of the Constitution, which we felt like if we look at them holistically, they are justifying the case for why we need to, to engage in a, in a, in a holistic uh, overview or, you know, really look at our Constitution again. And we have talked about the overbearing nature of the executive. We've talked about the weakened parliament, which is unable to hold the executive to account. And we can talk about several others more. I can... Perhaps I'll start with fair, pay fairness and what I call remuneration equity right. uh, under the Constitution. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges a lot of people have had is I saw Bright Simmons, for instance, put up a tweet uh, yesterday where he was comparing a member of parliament in, in the UK earning about, I think, £6,000 uh, per, per month and then a nurse earning about, I think, 4500 where the difference in remuneration is about 1, 1, 1. 1.5. Whereas in our case, you have a member of parliament earning about uh, $4,500 and then a nurse earning about four fifty. So about 10 times more. And these are questions that go into the value of work that we all contribute to making Ghana what it is. And this has been a bigger question, not only in terms of what people receive monthly, and it's a big concern for labor, organized labor, but also when they have served their, you know, their duty to the state and they retire, what happens to that? And this brings into perspective the whole Article 71 structure that a lot of people have talked about, the inherent, inherent unfairness in it. And that unfairness is not cured by the fact that we continue to put in a new committee every time to, disc to look again at uh, what we pay the executive and what we pay parliament. And then we ask them, to review, to, to approve it for each other, which a lot of people have talked about, uh, sort of a scratch my back, a scratch your back mm. arrangement that exists. Yeah. But the bigger concern at the heart of that is that it just feels inherently unfair for people and all of us to contribute certain things to, to making the democracy work, mm. and then for some to go home on so little. Mm. You know, I give the example so, so, of so, I was raised by a, a civil servant father mm. who spent the entirety of his life in, in the public service, and that today I have to be I have to take care of him practically. And 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 it's a, there's a question that goes to the heart of the democracy and the moral justness of the system we put in place. I remember your your take some time ago when you talked about um, the judge a judge denying you tag going on 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 strike, and there was a question about an Article 71 judge denying other people the right to be able to get fairness in, in salary remuneration. This connects directly to something the Constitution has created. In the past, the ways in which we have proposed to deal with this problem is to establish an independent emoluments commission. My argument is that it solves only one part of the problem, and it's a problem that it solves for only the executive and parliament. Yeah. which is that it removes the decision-making away from them so that they don't bear the criticism when it comes down to it. But the inherent question as to whether or not we should create some appetite pace structure where political appointees and certain people would be sorted out differently and the entirety of the public service would be under, say, uh, single spine salary structure. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It's something that we all need to really look at. Why not put everybody on the same equity salary structure, and that's what I'm talking about, pay fairness and equity. Mm -hmm. You know, and connected with that, I know the president made a big speech as well about taxation. And I think it's a, it's a real problem that 
disturbs our democracy in many ways. Uh, the fact that we are raising so little from taxes. Today, our taxes pay for, I think, uh, they help to service debt, and they pay, um, I think they paid some amount of, maybe not entirely, of our public sector. Uh, but the, the president complained, I think justly, about certain professionals and lawyers and others who are not paying sufficient due. And so the tie bedding is shifted to only public servants. But the president morally cannot speak about this issue, for instance, because the president, under the constitution, does not pay tax. So it is not here, it's not only about but how much are we raising from how much the president earns. And it's about, again, you know, equity and fairness, where the, the gentleman, the first gentleman or first lady of the land, whoever that would be, if that person is exempt from tax for no reason, that a discernible reason, it doesn't inspire the sort of leadership from the top that one would, would request for on tax issues. Mm. And that's in Article 68.5. That's something that also needs to change around that. Mm. And then there's also the problem of the retirement architecture under the Constitution itself. Right. One of the big problems during the Constitution Review Commission we had was, well, there are certain sectors of, of our society that, in fact, it's a disservice to the country if they retired at 60. A bigger part is the academia, for instance. Mm. And so one of the decisions is that why not remove that arrangement from the Constitution and put it into legislation? In fact, retirement age is one of the ways in which you deal with social problems around unemployment. Mm. In certain democracies, it also helps to to deal with the questions of the, the pension wage bill, that if it is becoming more expensive for the for the state to maintain the public the pension wage bill, you increase the retirement age a bit higher so people can work more. So if there's a lot of scope which you can do, which our constitution doesn't allow that to do. And what we have done is that we are now creating all kinds of arrangements outside of the constitution, which we allow certain people to stay for longer than 60 years. And then for certain people, like we saw with Domelevo and others, we, we kick him out of office, never mind that the board of directors superintending over him, uh, you have a, the chairman of the board who is over 80 years. Mm -hmm. so these are questions of, again, of equity within, within work and pay that, that helps our democracy run. Right. And that's one of the things that we need to deal with because mm. people are so unhappy about mm. and feel unfairly treated. Right. Now, as you mentioned that, my mind goes to uh, Articles uh, 24 and also uh, 70, 71 of the Constitution. But I almost uh, skipped uh, two points that I needed to refer to in my recap. That yeah. one of the points you made as a justification for a total overhaul of the Constitution was that Parliament was designed to check the executive and the judiciary to check both arms. But that doesn't seem to work in our experiment so far. And that there is no popular initiative, as we find in Kenya, where ordinary citizens, by a petition, can effect changes to their constitution. These are also very important. Now, you talk about pay inequity. And what a way for Bright Simmons to show us the contrast. So a senior nurse, we are saying that a member of parliament does better work, far more than a senior nurse will do, and that a member of parliament is far more important than what a senior nurse will do in saving lives. Therefore, in the UK, what a member of parliament earns is just a little more than what a nurse, a senior nurse earns. But in Ghana, what a member of parliament earns, a senior nurse is 10 times what a senior nurse will get. Um, the Article 24 says, every person shall have the right to work under satisfactory, safe, and healthy conditions and shall receive equal pay for equal work. Equal pay for equal work without distinction of any kind. Then, when we come to the famous Article 71 people, the President, the Speaker, the Deputy Speaker, Chief Justice, Auditor General, Chairman of the Independent Commi uh, 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 Constitutional Commissions, and so mm -hmm. on and so forth, 
um, the constitution says that the salaries and allowances payable and the facilities and the privileges the when it comes to the ordinary worker it doesn't talk about facilities and privileges but here for these class of people it talks about privileges and facilities to them how that has to be determined and they are to be determined by the president on the recommendation of a committee of not more than five persons appointed by the president acting in accordance with the advice of the council of state so in the nutshell he determines what he wants really then you know the way parliament also has to do and we talk about the i scratch your back you scratch my back situation and you, you spoke about pension the law says the salaries and allowances payable and the facilities available to the president the vice president the chairman and other members of the council of state ministers of state and deputy ministers being expenditure charged on the consolidated fund shall be determined by parliament on recommendation of the committee referred to blah 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 and then upon uh, whatever else the law says these salaries and conditions should not be varied to their disadvantage so the president retires on his salary correct yes the president retires on the salary and can never be varied to, to, to his, his or her disadvantage anytime at any point in his lifetime uh, must be good i think this i'm not saying it's bad i'm saying that it has to be extended to everybody else and you know that's what where and happiness is about isn't it mm. <laughs> okay so uh from the iniquity in you know salary and compensation and pension for everybody else what else should we consider as worthy for a total change of this constitution uh one of my big ones and one is that once the one i like a lot is about local governance or local government and decentralization you know i, I think one of the biggest questions around decentralization you have seen in all this conversation we've been talking about is whether or not we should elect the the MMBCs. And my argument is that if we take it through that approach, we again forget the whole purpose of the of the, the decentralization chapter under the constitution, chapter 20. The idea there is that the substance of governance and development must be brought down to the local level. That's the big gamble under the constitution. Now, if we go only to elect these individuals, have we solved some of the problems that are inherent in local government in general? Rather than amending itself, we have to rethink the framework. You have other places whereby uh, you may decide that instead of regions, our regions are not, I say they are not governance units per se. You may have a regional minister, mm. but it's not a functioning bureaucracy that controls. Mm. Why don't reconstitute them as provinces? Currently, the constitution says that a percentage, I think uh, not less than 10 or 15% of the consolidated fund needs to be involved there. I think we need to turn that around, that about 60% needs to go into those provinces, and then only 40 get of the national. So that the real process of developing and decentralizing changes. So that when you have a province, which then appoints its own you know, health administrators, have persons who advise on planning and development at the regional level, we will start to think of our regions as bodies that are in charge of having us develop. Mm. In fact, it brings the process of development closer to the people, mm. where they become more incentivized and they know the problems that are inherent there that a crab-based politicians do not know for them. The sad reality, though, is that presently, as we have come to learn, even the money that should go to these districts, these local places for their own development, yeah. The people you call the Accra politicians, they sit in Accra and determine how that money should be used. So the money is already expended. It doesn't even Accra. get to them. Yes. So if yes. they, need, they need some sanitation, they, they, they don't even ask that we want any, uh, take it for example, very popular, Zoom Lion to come and do any sanitation work. Accra yeah. will appoint Zoom Lion to go and do sanitation work. No, and they will yeah. take out of that amount. So by yeah. the time they send any money down, yeah. almost everything is finished. 
Yes, yes. Even the printing of paper, the letterheads to the paper, that contracting is all being done at the national level. And so we have defeated the idea of moving these things into the region and, now, and encouraging even intra-regional competition. So I'm thinking, let's reconstitute them as provinces with governors or counties and governors, where these are the people we, we know that they are setting in place a team mm. which is supposed to deal with the region. But it also then connects to how we tax and how we distribute tax. One of the bigger problems I became wide open to was the question of the Western region. And the fact that, you know, oil revenue and all those things that are coming from the Western region. And over time, it is building a sense of resentment in the region as to why are we producing so much and not gaining enough. Mm -hmm. If you turn the process around, such that you say whatever is generated from the region, you keep 60 and give 40 to national. The 40% of national would be used to readdress inequities, for instance, in regions which are often regions or distance, you can Less really center them. Yes, exactly. And then the resource-rich regions become a hub because you can't necessarily develop the whole entire country at the same pace. But certain places can become a lever to move your economy up. And that's what you want to be able to see. But you have to trust the people in the region and you have to be able to empower them to take charge of their region and do that. And then you use the national as a corrective mechanism such that now, for instance, when there's corruption at the local level, again, they come before public accounts committee and others, and we don't really follow up mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. Because already we are dealing with national level corruption to the extent that we are not even policing them enough. But if you move a lot more into the regions, then you have the, the national attorney general more interested now in punishing persons within those regions who are not persons they generally sit in cabinet with. All right. So all that ties into pure two problems at the same time, mm. right? So that resource question who, who, is at the heart who, who of Who are not persons he sits in cabinet with and potentially are not persons that were brought to that office by the vehicle of his party, his political Absolutely. party, to disable him from prosecuting them if they have to be prosecuted. Absolutely. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. So that's one of the things I'm thinking about. Because even what we're talking about, let me give a, a current example regarding, um, you know, public sector workers and getting the Ghana card, which is important, or even applying for a passport and things like that. The pace of decentralization of all those services is still an Accra-based decision-making process. That's right. These districts have no play in how that process works, mm. in bringing these activities and functions to their level. And that's a concern for a number of us who didn't grow up in Accra, who mm. lived in regions, but had to travel to Accra to get anything done. That's right. And that's a way in which we, you know, we discourage those places or fringe areas of our of our country from 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 being built up yeah in a significant way but that's something we can only rethink if we thought about the constitution holistically and we thought up and and give a thing back to why do we even have a decentralized process what are we trying to achieve mm. and if we elect them only and and keep all these structures in place would we have fulfilled the intended purpose of bringing democracy down and, and, to the and, level. And, and that reminds me of also a very important point you mentioned last week, that the, the, the amendment process, as in changing the constitution, must not be one that is led by, you know, the Accra politicians, so to speak, the yeah. people at the top. Presently, yeah. that, is, that appears to be the only way, yeah. the architecture. So... We set up a constitution review commission and it took the president to set it up. Yeah. It brought out what the people felt were some of the things they needed to be changed in the constitution. The commission presented the document to the president. The president issued a white paper, cherry picking. Say, you say this has to be changed. I agree. You say that has to be changed. I don't agree. Let's not touch that one. You say... We should change this in this way. That's what the people want. We disagree with the people. Let's change that, but through this other means. So that mm -hmm. even now, the district assembly election issues you are talking about, whilst we have overwhelming majority of the populace, the ordinary Ghanaian, who own the constitution, the constitution begins with a preamble that says that sovereignty, sovereignty springs from the people. And that government must be government that is administered for and on behalf and for the welfare of the people. 
The people say in their majority, over 70%, that they want DCEs to be elected and elected on non-partisan basis. The president insists that if you will not elect them through a partisan basis, I'm the one who brought my football and put it on the pitch. <laughs> I take it back. So that's, that's a big problem, a really big yeah. problem. So that's yeah. one other grounds for which you think, for the purposes of decentralization, uh, decentralization, we need to retweak the constitution by a change to bring development from bottom up and not the yeah. other way. Right. Um, there's something that you have been interested in that I'm familiar with, and it has to do with the... Um, the issue of the voting age, the presidential age, um, it's an interesting one. Uh, put in that one, and when you are done, maybe look at the issue that you wanted to talk about, about balancing gender, ethnic representation, regional representation, and the winner-takes-all issue, which you addressed a bit the last time. And then yeah. perhaps uh, we may take one more and then open the phone lines for uh, viewers to join with their questions. Yes, uh, one of, uh, you're right. One of the things I've been concerned about is, is representation, leadership, or maybe let for a fancy word, let's say uh, equity in leadership, right? Uh, I've been really thinking about the framework for representation that exists. And within this umbrella, you can put in the questions around the voting age, or who is entitled to make decision. I have always found it very peculiar that we say that the person who is 16 years can't have sex and have children but yet that person cannot vote. That's and the right. issue becomes even much more pressing, considering that we are a young population. On the continent generally, and in Ghana specifically, our average age is between 16 and 17 years. That is significant. And I think that we already in the Constitution we face, the question as to whether or not we should maintain the voting age at 18 came back again. And I think there's a question, it's a place where we can look at other democracies which have brought the voting age to 16 and think about that as a way to empower younger people and get them much more interested early on in the political process. There's also a question around the presidential age that I've talked about. And in, in so many you know, countries now, especially in Europe and across board, younger and more younger people are becoming interested in the political process, particularly because Older generation are interested in business and making money. They have realized that the public space is not the way you make that money. So they go into businesses. And they leave the grand ideas about climate change, about the environment, to young people to lead that process. So that the demographic in parliament in many of these established democracies is reducing. Those who are ending up in leadership are also reducing in age. And I find it weird and odd that in a country where our, you know, the median age is around 16 and 17. The entirety of our political class, you can pick 10 presidential appointees and they told, their total age adds up to 800. <laughs> and, and that's a big concern. Whereas in other places, you have a 35 year old who's a prime minister who has appointed a finance minister of 32 years old. You know, that's sort of bringing in young people who are much more interested in reform and big projects and big ideas early on, it's a key thing that we are missing. And, and, and I think it goes down to... That you say um, that the person can have sex at 16, but they cannot marry at 16. Then you mm. say, more importantly, where I want to bring your attention to, that you can vote to elect your president and your MPs when you are 18, but you yeah. cannot contest for elections... You cannot be a president unless you are 40 years. Yeah. Why yes, can I vote I, for I a president when a, I'm 18, but I can't contest to be president? And, and, and that's one of the structures you have put in place, which if the, the biggest sell of our election, even once we remove the age, it's about the person going about and making the case for, for so many people. I always, I always used to say something about when I was at the Constitution Review Commission, I was about 22, 23. I told all my colleagues I was 30 because I was always afraid that person would dismiss my views just because they thought I was younger. And that inherent ageism in the ways in which we treat younger opinion is a big problem. It, it disables so many young people of getting in the process and also being able you know, to engage in how we reform our democracy. So that's something that I think that 
we need to remove the age question around, around that. I, that tell people, age, I, te I tell people a joke about why I like to keep my new, <laughs> my new hairstyle. Because you see my gray. <laughs> <laughs> I tell people why I, I like to keep it. Uh, in doing my work in the courtroom every day. Yeah, mm. so, so if you were to suggest uh, the presidential age, because is it also not important that people yeah. must have some level of experience before you become a president to run a country, manage a whole country? So, but you see, you see, the electoral process checks that. So that if a 25-year-old was campaigning across the country, and people saw in this individual somebody who's created something, somebody who's saying something, who has something to show for it, they would gravitate towards that. They make their decisions for themselves, right? So there's no need, again, to put that structure, strictures into place in the Constitution. Once you've made a decision that this person can analyze the political space and make a decision as to who is best qualified to lead us, that person, we should open up the process for the person to be involved. Mm. And should we, um, should we also have a terminating point because this is a problem of Africa, where yeah. people who are demented, I mean, let's be blunt about it, people who yeah. are old, who cannot really think again, have become presidents, and they are not the ones taking the decisions. They've yeah. brought some people around them who are taking the decisions, and they must yeah. approve them. You know, I, I remember after the Fix the Country demonstration, I think Professor Yanka said, the demand by young people to be involved in the process uh, is a disrespect for the old. So fix, his thing was fixed disrespect for the old people. I think for me, the bigger issue around there is that we have found a way to, to solve the problem somewhat that pertains in, say, Cameroon and other places, mm -hmm. where there's respect for the two term. And that is important. I am not in the haste to limit the age. But it begs the question if you think that persons in the public sector are spent after 60, whether or not they are not equally spent and why they should be in, 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 in political positions. Yes. But I would rather we left the upper age open. But persons are free to disagree, obviously. No, but you, they, they have put in the constitution that when you are 60, yeah. you retire. If you are a judge yeah. of the superior court, you retire when you are 70. And then when it comes to day, the political leaders, they can be 100 yeah. and still want to be president. Why? Yeah. And they can appoint themselves this, irrespective of their age. They can even pass a... They can use statute to pass positions and create public offices and not abide by the age. These are the problems, you know, that are inherent in, you know, a certain class owning all the viable economic power and also getting all the political power. All right. Now, yeah. um, uh, our viewers, let me uh, yeah. announce to you that we are going to open the phone lines in the next five minutes. Uh, we will open the phone lines. You join us with your questions. Uh, you can ask any question regarding constitution and the change process to uh, Oliver Baka Vomawo. I can assure you he's more than capable to respond to any questions regarding the constitution that you will pose to him. So quickly, uh, look at the issue of the balance in gender, ethnic representation, regional representation, and winner takes all. And then yes. we open the phone lines. Uh, the, the last census have shown us that women continue to remain the majority in our country. In all political processes across board, unless there's intentional lawmaking, women often tend up to end being the minority in leadership. And you have to be intentional about it in solving that problem, like the way Rwanda has done. I know a lot of people are always asking the question, but if the person is not competent, why? And it only comes up really when it comes about questions of women being underrepresented and whether or not we should have affirmative action or not. I think we look at the example in, in, in Kenya. Kenya, in the, under their constitution, says that if you are appointing five people to any position, more than 50% of them, or more than 60% of them, cannot be of a particular gender. It is gender neutral in this language. So that if you're appointing only women, you're not appointing 100% women and leave men out. You try to think about how gender fits in. Uh, from the very beginning of our democracy, Nkrumah tried to address the problem of lack of women in the parliament by passing the law that allowed women, 10 women to be in parliament. Rwanda has solved that problem somewhat. We have to think about the ways in which we encourage women into the process. Are we going to fund women in, in the run for women? Are we going to be more intentional in limiting how we only put men in positions of power? 
These are questions that we need to deal with holistically. But there's a regional question as well that happens a lot. And this perception that certain, when the party is elected, it must tend that to, it is even sometimes judged by, well, the NDC came in power, what did you do for the voter region? But what, what did you do for the upper west region as well, right? Like, we should, if we incentivize political parties to be only interested in areas that vote for them, we create a problem. Mm -hmm. One of the ways in which you can deal with that is the saying that not only is, in terms of electing the president, should you only win 50 plus one, but you must have certain regional wins. That way, it creates an incentive to nourish the regions where you're going to be campaigning and then the regional balance which we are seeking. Mm. It makes you much more attentive in, again, if you join this with, you know, creating leadership structures around the regions by provinces and others, then regional level persons who have been groomed in leadership can find their way into governance generally. And I think this is a problem to minimize perceptions of strongholds and ethnicity that continues to haunt who we vote for and why we decide that a person of a certain extraction cannot win on the ticket of another party. These are things that diminish our democracy. You know, they make less of our commitment to being one and identify as Ghanaians mm. rather than, you know, divided people in, in, in the body politic. And I think that the constitution, when we looked at, can find a way to address some of these concerns uh, generally. Mm. You, you, the, the question of gender representation, the question of regional and, as you, you say, ethnic representation, that's been catered for in the, in the directive principles of state policy, as you find in Chapter yeah. 6 of the Constitution, not so? Yeah, so we've created the directive principles of state policy has become sort of like the political party's manifesto. Whereas all these good intentions, which we are hoping that politicians would be mindful to look at it and, and make that a core part of how they appoint and who they bring into the process. But that has not happened. And so the way in which you do is that you check individuals differently. That you rethink that, okay, if they are true, they are, they are Supreme Court have decided that eh, it is binding when you want it to be, sometimes it is not. And we can't really, there's no measure to determine when something under the Constitution is binding and, and enforceable, specifically when it comes to directive principles of state policy. Mm. So once you've included that, you know, inspirational idea, then you look at the structures of appointing powers and you bind them or the persons who are going to be making the decisions much more carefully. Mm. I, I remember one of the things we used to say during the constitution review process is that it's about tightening the nuts and bolts of the constitution. And we have to tighten those nuts and nuts and bolts in areas like this that ensure that persons do not take it as a Bible and keep it in their wardrobe All right. and actually enforce it. All right. Uh, thank you so very much, um, Oliver. Uh, Baka Voma is a researcher with the Cambridge University and has been a convener <clears throat> for Fix the Country. And Fix the Country has been leading uh, a new conversation for a change in the 1992 Constitution. We have been canvassing 10 reasons why this ought to be the case. Of course, as you can discover by now, you have had more than 15 reasons. It was just by way of titling that we said 10 reasons. Now the phone lines are activated. You can join us with your questions and he will be uh, more than glad to answer them. So please join us now with your questions. Whilst we wait for uh, uh, viewers to join us with their questions, um, you also were seeking to point to the area of accountability and corruption. What about that area that gives cause for a change of the Constitution? So, you know, a couple of days ago, I was reading a, a book, mm. 18 Years in the Good Court uh, by so, Brick sorry, 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 but I have uh, Daniel. Daniel, you're calling us from Teshi. Let's hear you, Daniel. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my greetings to all my uh, listeners and viewers. Actually, um, I'm a student and then I've been calling for a total of the 1992 Constitution. And then, in fact, um, the 1992 Constitution of Ghana actually gives the executive president enormous and then extensive powers of appointment. This over the years has led to the manifestation of Rina takes all policies as it was expressed by um, researcher worker Vomao. 
Yes. And as a result of the executive president of Ghana, it has exercised their powers of appointment to the benefit of only their, let me say, party apathics. And then uh, royalties without actually giving a record to appointment based on um, a non-partisan meritocracy. And in this regard, many Ghanaians, irrespective of their competence, because they do not belong to the ruling party. So uh, the 1992 constitution of Ghana actually gives the president so much power, and this has led to what we call the winner takes all politics and promoted clientelism. Mm. That's why people begin to have transactions with the various heads of political parties, so as to be given a portfolio. Okay, thanks for your it's contribution. Occupied. So you vote for a change of the constitution. Mm. Uh, yes. Archimedes, you are calling from Chifu Praso. Let's hear you, Archimedes. Yeah, good afternoon, Samson. Afternoon. Yeah, I want to contribute to your discussion. My concern is uh, the powers in the constitution are so much vested in the president. And one of them that I want us to separate or want to consider is the, the speaker position in parliament. I think the speaker is the third uh, in command when it comes to our constitution. So if the president and the, the vice are in government, are in executive position, I think the third person who is uh, the speaker, the constitution has to make it clear that the speaker should not come from the ruling government. So the, the speaker should come from whichever party will be in the, in the minority mm. or, or will not be in government so mm -hmm. that that speaker can also have some power to check the government. Just as we have now, mm. I think for the first time since 92, we are now seeing, I mean, uh, speaker, I mean, decision which is really in the interest of what the Ghanaians. Okay, thank you very much, Archimedes. Uh, you vote for a change in the constitution. Isaac, you're calling us from Gomwa Fete. Let's hear what's your question or contribution. Did I lose Isaac? Hello, Isaac. Okay, we lost Isaac. Uh, we'll get to the next person. But um, so we do that. You were beginning the point on accountability and uh, uh, corruption. Yes, uh, I was going to talk about, you know, whenever we've talked about how do we deal with the um, accountability and corruption at the Constitution, usually we one of the solutions we always come up with is let's just decouple Minister of justice and attorney general and then the problem is solved but i think that it, it goes to a lot more that we need to consider uh which is beyond just decoupling the role of attorney general and ministry of justice which is a really lawyer's problem but also think about you know public prosecutions generally and the, how they create and avenues for political interference uh holistically let's also think about the special prosecutor's role that we have created which a lot of people seem to lack, but we are still considering the constitutionality question uh, around it. And I think during the during the the uh, parliamentary vetting of the current special prosecutor, he raises a lot of questions that bother on constitutionality of the rule that is tied in into the way in which Article 88 is is is, is framed. Mm. Then we can think about again. I am also a very big fan of bringing people into the process. And in other places like South Africa, where we enable private prosecutions, I think private prosecutions are also a big way in which we can deal with some of the problems that exist. I'll, I'll return to you uh, to explain the private prosecution concept. Um, yeah. Abu Jamal Tamale. Abu, what's your question? Um, yes, good afternoon, sir. Hi. Uh, my contribution is to say that I will vote for yes. I'm voting here because this constitution does not give way and does not give hope for the youth. Since 1982, up to now, the youth does not have hope in the country. So I put my vote out from the country. Just because the power invested in the current government or any government within this 1982 constitution has made us not to feel that when your party is not in power, you can't get anything. Okay. So for me, I'm voting for yes, and I'll continue to vote for yes. You so vote for I a change of the vote. constitution. Thank you, Hubert. Thank you. You're calling us from Kumasi. Hello, Hubert. 
Um, we just lost Hubert. Hubert, call back. Uh, we'll pick your call. Isaac, go more fete. Call back. We'll pick your call. Uh, what is this idea of private, you know, prosecution? So private prosecution is something that, in fact, we used to exist in Ghana. Uh, it's one of the things that we inherited from British, from the British, where individuals could go ahead and prosecute cases. All you need to get is a lawyer and then go ahead and, and seek a prosecution of something that was affecting you. But we have a law that allows the Attorney General to simply appoint somebody to do that. Now, I mean, the, 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 the Attorney General's fiat, which has been exercised and given to you know, various institutions, forestry and other commissions, are institutionally led, that we have tended to give them to institutions. But I'm thinking about, you know, one of the things that was done by my friend Justice Tankebe, who's a criminologist here at Cambridge, is to look at the number of cases that the police prosecute out of the number of cases reported. And less than 15% of all cases reported to the police are in fact prosecuted year to year. Mm. And, and a particular area where this affects is issues around sexual violence, violence on women. Those are the most under-prosecuted areas of our law, and it's a big problem. So one of the things which you can do, which exists in other democracies, is that persons or NGOs can, can have a prosecutor who takes on those cases and prosecutes on their behalf, and takes on the cost of prosecution. And currently now, I understand that, uh, like even currently as it exists now, there's no way in which individuals can seek those prosecutions and be able to move certain things forward if the president, if the, the attorney general says I'm not going to Very work interesting forward. approach. Uh, Kwesi in Brekum. Kwesi, let's hear you. Uh, oh, Kwesi, did I lose you? Hello, Kwesi. Hello, yes, please. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. What, good afternoon. Yeah, what I want to talk about, if the constitution can be changed concerning Senate, you see, contribution is just only one uh, insurance that we need to pay our contribution to towards you. So I want them to know. I have to change it so that they will do it not monopoly for uh, one, one uh, company to collect all our things. Okay, so you want uh, the uh, institution of uh, the pension institution like SNIT? Diversify. Um, Al Hassan, Al Hassan, you are calling from Savilugu. Let's hear you. What is something? Hi, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I support the change of the constitution because yeah, the current state of the constitution it favors it gives much power to the executives and then uh, in fact uh, it does not allow space for uh, uh, the other operators to bring out their views. Mm. Just that, like uh, last year, how the, uh, this, what do you call it, uh, Auditor General was asked to leave office. There were those who asked him to leave or based on age, they themselves have, their ages are even more than his age. Mm. So, in fact, uh, Mr. Oliver and you yourself, in fact, I say God bless you elephant, but not the MPP elephant. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, please um, call with your questions. We have just about some four minutes to give you the opportunity to ask questions. Kofi, Kofi Awune, um, you are calling from Doma. Let's hear you. Hello, Kofi. Yes, sir. Yes, go ahead with your question. Speak up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon to you. Yeah, good afternoon. Please go ahead. Yeah. I'll go for a review. Uh, I mentioned in the two positions, uh, as you said earlier, we, we, we don't have opportunity, so I'll go for you considering the position. All right, thank you for your input. Um, Mohammed, Mohammed, you are calling us from Teshi, and uh, Mohammed will be our very final caller so that we can give Oliver the opportunity to um, conclude nicely. Um, I wish you were asking questions. Hello, Mohammed. What's your question? You are calling from Teshi. Yes. So good afternoon to everybody. Mohammed, please let's hear you. Yes. So my my, my first one is a contribution about this uh, gender issues. Personally, I'm not a supporter of. Hello. We are listening. Yes. Personally, I'm not a supporter of. 
these issues about gender representation, for me, whoever we are putting in power should be somebody who can work to the advantage of everybody. If we start putting figures into these discussions, we might get to a point where it becomes uh, 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 something around our necks that we cannot deal with. So let's put people who will be fair to everybody and who will work to the advantage of everybody. My second point is about uh, seeking your opinion on this whole executive system of president. Personally, I think we should be going the parliamentary way. We have a fusion I, I, of I the executive and parliamentary, and that's yeah. what... Uh, uh, Oliver pointed out it's uh, one of the problems that we need to work with. Elsewhere, people can, uh, you know, get their, their, their parliament to do a number of things. Here we can do even though we have that system. Okay, so thank you very much. Mohammed also called from Teshi. Um, so that's a question to you. He feels that the parliamentary is better than the executive. What do you think? Or the fusion? You know, I, I personally think that the reason why the fusion doesn't work, you can think about the parliamentary as one approach, is that it thrives on the idea that the prime minister is a member of the parliament as well. So the question sometimes we'll say, well, in those cases, you don't have any division. What about that? Is that persons who are also parliamentarians within the party have an equal place to replace that prime minister. Mm -hmm. So that intra competition within them strengthens that process. We take that out completely. And we created this hybrid mechanism that doesn't work. Uh, so that's kind of a quick reaction to that. Uh, but if I was to give sort of my final thoughts now. Yes, please uh, do. I think, I think my bigger concern has always been that let us not think that our democracy will be sustained if we create a distinct political class who maintains certain alliances and allegiances to the exclusion of the general population. It would breed dissent and our democracy would fail in the long term. The best way forward is to ensure that people have pathways to renew and, re you know, to improve the democracy. Create avenues for the people to be brought into the process. And I am very particular about that. The president has said something about this is the longest in the constitution that has stood the test of time. It may be true. It has because for a long time, the persons who have contributed to the collapse of the uh, democracies have been military people and elites. For as long as we keep a pop population dissatisfied and disengaged from our politics, our biggest fear would be we have created a class that would be fighting the people. And it's not only, history tells us the same thing. When we had the monarchies, the people came up and ate up those monarchies. That's my bigger concern that we need to avoid for the long term and for the long road ahead. Thank you so very much. Oliver Baker Vomawo is lawyer and convener uh, Fix the Country. He's a researcher with Cambridge University and we have been dealing with 10 reasons for a new constitution. Today has been the second and final installment of that discussion we started last week. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you have been educated sufficiently. Always remember that uh, the, these discussions are available on YouTube and you can listen over and again. I'm Samson Ladi Anyanini. This has been The Law. This is your Legal Light and Health Law. We come your way next week with another edition.